Greetings, Windsor Essex. My name is Jordan Pope, and you're listening to We Talk History. I am very excited to begin this series, and there are many reasons why. I've been interested in the subject of history for a long time, and I'm sure that you enjoy it as well if you are listening to this podcast. My favorite thing about history is that it's a limitless topic. You can't run out of any material. In school, we've learned about everything from ancient Egypt and Greece, the Roman Empire, the Middle Ages, colonization of the New World, etc., etc. Although there is an important topic of history we haven't discussed in the classroom. That is the history of our area, Windsor and Essex County. That's why this podcast is all about our history. My family has lived in this region for generations. My ancestors were English and French. Possible that some of them settled here as early as the 18th century. I want to know about what their lives were like when they were alive. What did our area look like? I have many questions that I hope can be answered over the course of this series, and I'm sure many of you also have questions. Now, before I begin my first episode here on We Podcast, it's important that you know I am in no way an expert of history or any other related field. I'm just a 17-year-old high school student who likes to learn new things. I will try my absolute best to find the most reliable sources possible and provide you with accurate information from an unbiased perspective. Anyways, that's the introduction to my show. I hope you enjoy listening to We Talk History. Considering this is the first episode of We Talk History, I believe it's appropriate to discuss the origins of our area before we, di- before we dive into any other topic. The area today known as Windsor and Essex County was in the same condition as every other region in the New World before the European empires began colonization. Windsor was an area only of wilderness and natural beauty. The only occupants were the men and women of various aboriginal tribes, the Ottawas, the Wyandots, the Chippewas, and many others. It's believed that they live in present-day Windsor and LaSalle hundreds of years before European settlers arrived. It wasn't until 1701 when Antoine de la Moth Cadillac would claim the land in the name of King Louis XIV, the monarch of the French kingdom at the time. Cadillac would establish Fort, and forgive me if I'm saying this wrong, Pont Chartrain du Détroit, where approximately 100 people would become the first settlers in the area. The fort was named after Count, again, Pont de Chartrain, a prominent French politician. Some of the settlers were members of the French military and others were colonists from the old country, mainly farmers and other tradesmen. The name Detroit or Detroit was coined by Cadillac. He called it La Ville de Troyes, which translates to the City of Straits, referring of course to the Detroit River. It's amazing to me how at one time, only a few hundred years ago, you could only see natural beauty on the riverfront, inhabited only by the indigenous people of the land, and a few French soldiers and farmers as well. It's unimaginable to picture that now, when we have massive buildings lining both sides of the big bridge connecting two separate nations. As mind-boggling as that may be, I think it's safe to say that Cadillac, the early French settlers, and the natives would all be blown up would all be blown away by what we've done in only a few hundred years. Now, yes, these people were the first settlers in the area. However, there were many settled on the American side of the river. The fortification was in present day Detroit as well. But I'm not really concerned with Detroit on this show. I want to focus on the origins of Windsor, Essex. And really, our settlement history doesn't start until nearly a half a century after Cadillac's colonization of present day Detroit. The year is 1749, and French settlers finally begin colonizing the Canadian side of the Detroit River. The population at that time, in present-day Essex County, was obviously made up of only First Nations people. The first settlement in this area on the Canadian side of the Detroit River was at Turkey Creek, which at the time was the closest available land to the farms and fort in Detroit. Now let's all try to think back to our explorer units in elementary school, when the French established farms on long, narrow plots of land along the St. Lawrence River. Well, the system was no difference along the Detroit River. There was no difference. Farther south along the river, there were native peoples, the Wyandots, who occupied the lands near the island known today as Boblo Island. Many of the history buffs listening out there are probably wondering about our area's involvement in the Seven Years' War. 
Colonization only occurred a few years before the war broke out between the British and the French, and also other various tribes on both sides. Well, we were involved. The French surrendered Fort Detroit to the British in 1760 when New France collapsed. The native tribes living in the surrounding area did not like the new British occupants. Geoffrey Anhurst, the man who had at Amherstburg and General Anhurst High School named after him, implemented policies that hurt native tribes. This situation led to the most notable battle that took place at Fort Detroit in May of 1763. Ottawa Chief Pontiac convinced many fellow warriors to join him on a mission to attack Fort Detroit. And that is exactly what they did on May 7, 1763. Pontiac and 300 natives conducted a surprise attack against the British. However, the commanding officer at the garrison was aware of the attack, and Pontiac's men were forced to retreat. Two days later, Pontiac attacked Fort Detroit once more. This time, he was supported by 900 warriors from several different tribes. These attacks encouraged other native tribes to resist the British with military force as well. Eventually, Pontiac's insurgency war forced the British to negotiate with the Ottawa chief. Eventually, they brought the fighting to an end. Those really are the oldest events in recorded history that we uh, that have occurred in our general area. And they've all taken place mainly in present-day Detroit and sometimes in Windsor-Essex. A lot of things we're going to talk about will be related to uh, the history of our neighbors in Detroit. Following the American Revolutionary War in the 1770s and 1780s, most of the continent was divided between British North America and the United States, otherwise known as the 13 colonies. We all know that the Americans officially won their independence from the British Empire when they signed the Treaty of Paris in 1783. So that raises the question, what about us? Well, the British Empire and the United States negotiated the boundaries of their lands. Eventually, the Jay Treaty was signed in 1796, 13 years after the Treaty of Paris. Now, the British agreed to vacate their eight forts in American territory. Among them was Fort Detroit. Windsor-Essex was still under the jurisdiction of the British Empire, as we were located in the province of Upper Canada. Now, Sandwich Township, known today as Windsor, of course, was founded all the way back in 1794. Sandwich was a popular area of settlement at the time, and it attracted British loyalists that lived in the former 13 colonies, and also veterans of the Revolutionary War fighting on the side of the British. We see evidence of this all the time uh, surrounding us, mainly the Duff Baby House is probably the best example in our area today. It was built in 1798 by Alexander Duff as a fur trading post, and is still standing today at 221 Mill Street in Windsor. There's a lot of history behind that building. It was purchased back in 1807 by Upper Canada Judge James Baby. Eventually, the U.S. Army General William Henry Harrison used the Duff Baby House as a headquarters during the War of 1812 when the Americans overran the British and captured it. If you know your American history well, then you're probably aware of General Harrison because he eventually became President Harrison in the United States. He was in office for only 21 days before dying of ammonia. Now, to me, it's incredible that there's still a building standing in our city, right on Mill Street, where the ninth president of the United States plotted attacks against the British 205 years ago. Eventually, General Brock's men forced the Americans back into Detroit. He and his men gathered at Fort Malden in present-day Amherstburg to plan the attack on Fort Detroit along with Chief Tecumseh's native warriors. The British and native forces fought the Americans at the Siege of Detroit, or better known as the Battle of Fort Detroit in our elementary school textbooks. The British set up artillery weapons on the Canadian side of the Detroit River and bombarded the American fortification in Detroit. Thousands of vehicles cross over the Detroit River every day. It's hard to believe that 205 years ago, Instead, it was mortar shells that were fire, fired over that same river. There were two British ships firing at De Fort Detroit as well. The following day, Tecumseh's men crossed the river eight kilometers away from Detroit. Later that day, 
three small British brigades followed the native warriors. Brock advanced to attack the backside of the fort, William Hamilton Merritt, a Canadian cavalry officer noted, and I quote, Tecumseh extended his men and marched them three times through an opening in the woods at the rear of the fort in full view of the garrison, which included them to believe that there were at least two or three thousand Indians, end quote. Hall was intimidated by the war cries of the, nat of the natives and feared that the women and children in the fort, including his own family, he had a daughter and a granddaughter living there, were, and they, he believed that they were in danger. Hall raised the white flag in surrender against, against the British and against the advice, of his, the advice of his own men. The 582 American soldiers at the fort were imprisoned in Quebec City after that. There were casualties, but only a few, as, a British, as the British fired an exploding shell into the fort's officer, Mess Hall. The British and natives were victorious, defeating General William Hull's men. The British would hold the post for over a year after the victory. So I thought I'd take this time today to discuss the show and how we're basically going to do the series. We covered our area's origins today before discussing the beginning. I, I excuse me, excuse me. Um, I figured on our first episode, it would be most appropriate to cover the, air, the origins of our area. So I don't intend to discuss everything in order. I'll be all over the map. If you take a quick look at our show's logo, we have a few iconic photographs and works of art. Starting at the top left side is wreckage caused by the Essex train station explosion of 1907 in my hometown of Essex. Besides the fire that burned down my high school, Essex District High School, in the 1920s, the explosion at the train station has been one of the most significant moments in our town's history. And I'm very excited to jump into that. Going clockwise down that logo, we have a platoon of infantry soldiers from the Essex Scottish Regiment avoiding German sniper fire, German sniper fire in the Netherlands during World War II. Actually, one of my classes at school, my writer's craft class, is going to be visiting um, some veterans at some point within the next couple of weeks. They're mostly going to be World War II veterans most likely and Korean War veterans. So I'll definitely share my discussions on a future episode with those people. It's very cool to talk to those people since there aren't many of them around, so I'm definitely going to take advantage of that. Now after that, there's a photo of the Windsor Assembly from the 1960s. We all know how important the automotive industry has been to Windsor in recent history dating back almost an entire century. Many of you probably know someone who's worked in the industry, or maybe you yourself have worked there at some point as well. So we'll tackle that in the future as well. Under that photo is a, is a painting of the ba battle at Pelee Island during the Windsor campaign of the Patriot Wars in 1838. Now, in school, we don't really discuss the Patriot Wars very often um, or at all, but it's, very, it's been very important to our area. There were a few battles that occurred around our area, so I'm definitely going to focus an episode towards that, hopefully our next episode or very soon. Anyways, um, the next photo we have is the Ambassador Bridge. We all know what that is. Um, I believe that photo was taken in some, at some point in the 1930s. I want to say 1935. Um, when people think of Windsor, they think of the Windsor Spitfires, the Ambassador Bridge, and so that is one of the more important things and um, that stand out in our area. When people think of Windsor, that's one of the first things that comes to mind. It connects us with our neighbors in Detroit, who we often talk about as well on this show. The final photo is a painting of the Canadian side of the Detroit River, painted in 1821. We discussed early history today, and I'd like to jump into that topic again at some point in the future. Like I said, we're going to be all over the place. So I plan on setting up some kind of email attachment or um, a social media page where um, listeners can send their ideas in. Um, if maybe my, my information isn't 100% accurate, I encourage people to correct my information, then we'll deal with it on the show. And also, um, send in ideas of what 
topics of history you'd like to talk about. Um, you know, we don't just have military history in this area. We have economic history um, with the automotive industry and so on and so forth. Well, I thought I'd keep it short and sweet today. So I'll see you next time on We Talk History. But before I stop, I'd like to give a word for the Essex County Humane Society. How would you like an entire year of free drinks? Well, now is your chance to win up to $1,200 in LCBO gift cards while supporting a great cause. The Windsor-Essex County Humane Society's popular Cheer for a New Year raffle is back, with five amazing prices, prizes to be won. Tickets are just three for $10 and are available at the Humane Society in several local shops. Check out windsorhumane.org for a full list of participating retail locations. The draw is December 27th. So grab your tickets today for the perfect stocking stuffer and have yourself a New Year's Year to remember. Thank you, Windsor-Essex.